Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Crystal Quaid, and I am the coordinator for the Rural Power Coalition. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, as you saw in the chat, we're asking that everyone would let us know their location or where you're coming from in the chat so we just have an idea. Um, so we're excited to have this discussion. As you all know, Congress has made a historic investment into rural communities when it passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and now it's up to us to make sure that those communities have a voice in the way uh, that this money is distributed. Um, we, there is about more than $10 billion that's available to rural electric cooperatives, so we're going to talk a little bit today about that money and uh, talking points through the process. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as you all know, um, electric cooperatives are extremely critical to the national interest in rapid energy. Um, about 12% of the U.S. population is made up of cooperatives, yet it makes up about 20% of carbon emissions. Um, and we cannot meet our targets for greenhouse gases without uh, reforms to our electric cooperatives. When we talk about the federal financial uh, instruments that we're dealing with here, under the IRA, there's about $1 billion for rural and remote, $3 billion for smart grids, and then if you go into the IRA, $9.7 billion uh, for GT and co-ops, $1 billion for renewable energy loans, $2 billion for REAP and tax credits, and um, we'll talk a lot more about that as we continue to go through these slides. But as I said, it's important that we're assuring that engagement is in this discussion when it comes to investment, that our rural communities are at the table as decisions are made. So I'm going to pass it over to Chris with the Mountain Association to go through the next few slides. Thanks, Crystal. I'm going to do a little bit of background about why uh, RECs or electric cooperatives are so critical to our national interests in a rapid energy transition. And I just want to thank the folks who joined us on such short notice and note that we're going to try to, uh, you know, keep the intro um, at a higher level since uh, most of y'all have seen have been with us on multiple, multiple um, webinars before. So on the next slide, you've seen this slide before. Um, but it just shows how vast the electric co-op system is, how integral it is to the U.S. energy system. Almost 900 co-ops, you know, with a, a creating an economy of a, over $40 billion of electricity to 42 million families across 47 states. And so, as we know, addressing equity is the center of our work. Uh, it's also the center of our administration's uh, goals for um, climate transition. And so, RECs are uh, right in the center of that equity conversation because they serve 92% of persistent poverty counties, many um, tribal communities and communities of color. And so it's important to remember, right, that these RECs are all actually owned by their customers and they're founded on co-op principles like democratic member control, economic participation member economic participation and concern for community. And that's gonna be important as we figure out how to access these federal resources. So we'll move to the next slide and just uh, continue to review and ground about the importance of this. Uh, the co-ops have been historically um, excluded from federal incentives. I was shocked to find out today uh, for almost um, three decades now. They have not been able to access the same tax credits that investor-owned utilities have. That's part of the reason why they still own a total of 55,000 megawatts of fossil-fueled generating capacity and have historically not invested in renewable energy. And so the next slide puts that a little more into context. Um, out of that 55,000 megawatts, 16,000 of that is coal plant capacity with no retirement date. And you'll see that most of the largest um, and most carbon intensive utilities are cooperatives across 12 states. And so um, that's also happening in the context, as you'll see on the next slide, of an historic problem uh, with governance, a well-recognized challenge that is um, illustrated by the NRECA's own governance task report and uh, task force report. And then also, just as one example, um, is evidenced by the scorecards that were just released yesterday by the Advancing Equity and Opportunity Collaborative on the Energy Democracy Y'all platform. We encourage y'all to take a look at that. And so that brings us to the next slide about why we're why we're centering good governance because 
the way that these incentives and the federal programs are structured, um, you need to engage your communities as a pathway to sound investment. And so based upon what we've seen to date, co-ops and stakeholders who are already engaged, they're the ones who are going to be most well positioned to swiftly recognize and achieve the transformative potential of, of the uh, financial solutions that are at hand. And so those financial solutions are shown up briefly on the next slide. Um, basically, we are proud to claim part of the win. We worked hard to get um, a 10% down payment on the $100 billion transition that, that is needed. And we've got uh, resources at hand. Um, and we look forward to figuring out how to help the federal government help our communities spend those most in the most wise and impactful ways. So I will turn it over to who uh, Andrea Miller. Thanks for joining us, Andrea. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Chris. I'm going to be talking about the federal commitment to equity and inclusion, which is a really, really, really critical step in recognizing that there is an incredibly diverse community that makes up rural America. So next slide. Now, the, a, there is an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. So when we say underserved communities, think communities of color, low income communities. And we have many communities in the rural areas that are both, they are low income community of color. So what the goal is, is to look at what are the potential barriers for underserved communities to enroll and access the benefits and services in federal programs. A very real barrier is people in rural areas do not know these programs exist. And if you don't know it exists, it's a little hard to enroll in it. What are the barriers that these communities will face in taking advantage of agency procurement and contracting opportunities? We did a lot of work with REC on reaching out to Black contractors. And again, what we find is that local communities do not know these programs exist. They were not aware that contracting opportunities exist. And many states have done a very poor job of tracking minority contractors. One of the things that is desperately needed is we need new guidance documents written for real people, not government and agency employees. Now, place-based is very, very critical in rural. One of the reasons it's so critical is in many rural areas, there really is no internet. I live in a rural county in Virginia, but it happens to be a golf course county. There are many, many people who live in my county where the internet is available if you have a phenomenal amount of money to pay for it. If you don't, then you don't have internet. And then there are still areas where there is no broadband available at all. Now, stakeholder engagement. Agencies need to come up with a plan that number one, let stakeholders know that these programs are available and give stakeholders the ability to put in their feedback. Now, in Virginia, we actually passed a law in 2019 that legally required our rural electric cooperatives to initiate and hold a stakeholder process. 
However, the devil was in the details and they didn't really give any details. So we are hoping that now with the federal government, we will be able to really help these agencies understand what they need to do. We want to coordinate with other federal agencies that are already doing the same thing. So in other words, we don't need agencies totally starting from scratch. So since the federal government has said 40% that's nearly half of the overall benefits of federal investment must go to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized and overburdened by pollution. There are so many states, especially in the South, where this is true. So when we look at the Justice 40 initiative, they defined the categories of investment, climate change, clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transit. This one is huge, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, remediation and reduction of legacy pollution and the development of critical clean water and wastewater infrastructure. Probably everybody on this call has read about Jackson, Mississippi, which is urban, but in Mississippi and a heavily BIPOC community, they don't have clean water. So we will be working with the Justice 40 and the USDA um, to make sure that learnings from previous programs get incorporated and added into all the new programs. So there is a new tool. It is a map where you have the ability to see what communities literally by county are currently suffering from environmental and economic justice issues. And we will be dropping that link in the chat. It is live. You can go and you can look at it and you will discover that there are states in New England where there seems to be relatively little climate and economic justice burden. However, when you look in the deep south, you will see that states like Alabama, almost every county is impacted. So next slide. This is the map. This is a picture of the map. We have dropped a link in the chat where you can actually go to that map and see what areas in your state are impacted. So again, look at Ohio and then come south, come all the way around, heading west through Texas. And oddly enough, there are many communities in California. So thank you very, very much. All right, thank you for that, Andrea. Um, so now I'm going to speak to uh, how we can actually get this money out to communities. Next slide, please. So here uh, we have an example of the Department of Energy process for getting out uh, some of their program dollars and getting folks educated and aware of the uh, various programs they can apply for. So the Department of Energy held a call with thousands of registered participants to present its funding opportunity process and the attendant opportunities for engagement. As you can see, uh, there's a pretty robust process here to ensure community engagement all throughout the process uh, to make sure that the communities that are actually going to benefit and apply for this funding are prepared to go after it. So unfortunately, with the USDA, they did not follow the same approach that we would have liked from the Department of Energy in rolling out uh, implementation uh, of the Inflation Reduction Act, specifically the programs that we're advocating for for electric cooperatives and their member owners. 
So despite prior pledges to identify opportunities for interagency coordination, the USDA Rural Utility Services is not indicating that $9.7 billion in grants presents an opportunity. So uh, USDA Rural Utility Services, instead of going for um, that robust Department of Energy engagement process, they went for a two-hour listening session followed by a comment period, which will be ending on November 28th. Uh, with no request for information about policy decisions for implementation. So, and as you can see in the graphic, uh, they cut out those steps that the Department of Energy uh, opted in to do, which uh, we see as a missed opportunity. So as part of our comments that we're submitting, uh, we've been making it clear that this lack of engagement um, is unfortunate and that we would like to see this rectified moving forward. Uh, and that if we really want community engagement to be at what you know we're hearing they want it to be at, we need this to be uh, a little more open to getting public input. So in the core tenets of energy equity, procedural equity is an important determinant of distributive equity. And the most common form of community engagement among mainstream institutions is consultation, usually in the form of semi-interactive meetings in which members of the community have the chance to offer input into pre-baked plans. This is, of course, a step up from one-way information sharing. A two-way exchange is initiated. The biggest critique of this form of engagement is that decisions are often already made. The community input period simply serves to check a box. We would like to make sure that doesn't happen here. We don't want to tokenize communities and just have them check a box. We would like to actually have authentic community input and engagement to make sure that these projects are done in ways uh, that are supported and um, advocated for from within communities that need them the most. So a big uh, benefit of the Department of Energy process is they've put a lot of focus on community benefit plans. They have a lot of detailed information on what uh, that currently entails for existing programs. We don't have a lot of guidance on what that's going to look like for the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, but the main pieces of this are that uh, they set four core policy priorities, which are investing in America's workforce, engaging communities in labor, advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and implementing Justice 40 programs, which we've talked about a little bit already today. Um, this would also be looking at finding the best applicants, and those plans are going to be prioritized on those criteria, as well as plans that are specific, actionable, and measurable. And we will have guidance on this uh, once we know more uh, when that's available from the Department of Energy and USDA. As of right now on energy.gov, you can find uh, the existing community benefit plans requirements, and uh, we expect it'll be similar for the IRA. But again, we'll know more when that is available. And now we can speak to the call to action. Take it away, Bree. Cool. Thanks, Philip. Hey, y'all. My name is Bree Nisley. I'm the Tennessee Campaign Manager for Appalachian Voices, and I will speak briefly on next steps around IRA implementation. We can go to the next slide, please. Right. So as Philip mentioned, unfortunately, USDA is kind of off to a bad start when it comes to gathering community input on how these programs should be implemented. There was uh, or there were two hour long listening sessions that happened a couple of weeks ago. And right now, a public comment period is open for these different programs that electric cooperatives will have access to. I've got the docket number on the slide here. You can go to the Federal Register and leave your own comments on some of the questions that UD, USDA is asking for input on. Um, one big question that USDA wants input on is how to ensure participation um, in accessing funding in disadvantaged, distressed communities, especially where projects are going to have an environmental justice impact. That is a huge question. And I think, you know, definitely takes more than one listening session on that topic. <laughs> To address that question or just a month of gathering comments through the federal register but if y'all have thoughts on how to approach that question you should definitely leave comments in the register and then you know for the programs that co-ops have access to there are specific questions like the 9.7 billion dollar program that co-op gnts can access to transition to clean energy um, some of the parameters around that program are achieving the greatest emissions reductions and USDA wants to know how to set the metrics around that. How do they actually measure emissions reductions? Um, the other two programs, the $1 billion for additional renewable energy loans, there's some questions around how to determine loan forgiveness. Um, the USDA secretary can actually get forgive more than 50% of the loan. And then there's some question about like what 
what criteria should exist for determining whether or not more than 50% should be forgiven. And then the Renewable Energy for America program, um, there's also some question about like whether there should be a standard grant amount that goes to all applicants or a tiered approach to deciding how much money each applicant will get. Those are the kinds of questions USDA is asking. The Rural Power Coalition has put together a letter with our input on what this process should look like, which y'all can sign on to. And Tom has dropped that in the chat, but feel free to sign on to our letter, share it around with your people. And again, if you want to provide your own comments to USDA or work with communities to provide comments, you can go into the federal register and leave a comment. Also reach out to us if you need support with that. And then I'll just quickly say, you know, on a broader level or looking at the more long-term, Rural Power Coalition is looking at organizing in our communities where many of our organizations have been working for a long time now um, in rural electric cooperative service areas to try to help educate and inform impacted communities about these opportunities and also work with cooperative leadership around implementation. So um, we are working on that and look forward to talking with you all about that as well. And I think that's it from me. Thank you, Bree. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Appreciate your input.